Hello everyone, I hope you can hear me. So this talk is going to be about physics and um, physics is rather an abstract science and it's a science I think that's not the most favorite of most people, probably most of you. Uh, and after seeing the previous video I can sort of guess why because I didn't understand a single word of what was said about quantum mechanics there. Now I'm going to try and explain some very, very simple and basic facts, and they're facts that we do understand, but I'll ask you to bear with me on one front, just for a little while. This science of physics is traditionally uh, found hard to appreciate by people because it doesn't have much to do on the face of it with people. If you think back about all the talks you heard today, in one way or the other, they're about people, and here we're going to talk about things that are somehow outside us, not us, and we'll see that it's still very interesting, it embodies very deep truths, it contains beauty, it's very beautiful, and ultimately it rebounds back on us and influences our lives, but for that we have to be just a little patient. Now, I'd start by talking a little bit about truths, and I hope I can convince you that there are a few little things about truths that maybe we didn't focus on and that we can focus on now. So in order to produce a nice comparison, I've produced, I first quoted an artist, a writer actually, uh, who says, the pure and simple truth is rarely pure and never simple. This was Oscar Wilde. But I want to counterpose that with a view of one of the greatest physicists that ever lived. This is a scientist's view. And he says, all truths are easy to understand once they're discovered. The point is to discover them. This was Galileo Galilei. And I'll try to sort of peddle, if you like, Galileo's view about science and try to talk a little bit about history and then a little bit about what's happening now. Now here's the man himself, as you can see, quite a beauty. And next to him, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, where he is supposed to have, according to an apocryphal story, carried out a famous experiment by dropping stuff from the top. Now he discovered a universal truth. All objects fall at the same rate under gravity. It's something that everyone here knows, I believe. But the experiment is very instructive. It gives the exact same result, regardless of race, creed, gender, national, national origin, <laughs> or cultural bias. And that I find a wonderful thing. And I decided to show you a little fantasy. So at one click of a button, you see Kutubuddin Ebak, founder of the slave dynasty, next to his Kutub Minar. And it could have been him and his Minar if it was leaning just a little bit to do the same experiment and get the same result. Not only that, I'll show you a formula involving a square root. You saw earlier today how to make a square root by, I forget now, but it's there. And this formula will predict for you how long it takes for an object to reach the ground if I drop it from a certain height in meters. I just divide by 4.9 and take the square root and I get the answer in seconds. And now, even though I'm not supposed to be a performer here, I'm going to do the experiment for you. So on one side, I have my car keys. On the other side, I could use this expensive remote, but maybe not. I'll use this, I'll use my house keys. I think they're about five times heavier. And here's the experiment. I hold them up to roughly the same height and let go. There you are. Okay. The greatest experiment in the history of science, and I've done it here for you. Please go home and do it again. Now, I want you to think through one very strange fact. Aristotle and the ancient Greeks believed this, experiment, believed this result would not be true. They felt it was obvious that a heavy object falls faster than a light object. And they were wrong, and for some reason they didn't bother to check. Nor did the ancient, nor did the Indus Valley civilization, as far as we know, nor did the Persians in the 10th century. But it was Galileo, and I don't think because he was brighter by that much than all the rest. I think there was something in the air that enabled him to do this at his time. And of course, of course, he was a brilliant man, and he changed our view of everything by this one very transformatory experiment. Okay, now things start to get a little more difficult. Classical physics is easy to do at home or on the stage. Quantum theory is a little harder. But here's the central message of quantum theory. Every particle is also a wave, 
and behaves like a wave with crests and troughs in its wave function. Now, if this sounds like mumbo jumbo, I'd like to show you an experiment that was done and has been done repeatedly. It's a very simple one to look at. So here's the schematic of the experiment. You have a gun here, and it fires an electron one at a time, bang, 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 with a gap, let's say a second between electrons. Okay. Now each electron can decide it's sort of fired uniformly here. It can go through this slit or that slit. And then it lands on a screen where you get a recording. And this is just a schematic, but here's the actual experiment done by the Hitachi Corporation, who made a lovely video out of it. At the beginning, you see a few dots. Then you see more dots. Then you see still more dots. And at the end, wow, you get a spectrum of dark and light fringes, interference fringes. And these are one electron going in at a time. Each electron is somehow managing to interfere with all the electrons that went before and after. And this is a miracle of quantum mechanics. Now, of course, it, as I said, it looks like mumbo jumbo. And in a sense, it is. But we have very good equations. And we can predict what will happen over and over and over again. And finally, this is the reason why your mobile phones work, for example. Okay? This science is under our control, even if it's hard to imagine at an intuitive level. So let's move on. And let me try to highlight one of the major lessons from this fact. Modern physics embodies a key aspect of scientific truth, which is that the truth is really outside ourselves. It's not something we sort of manufacture. Of course, philosophers like to argue about this all the time, and it's interesting. But there's a sense, I think, the two experiments I've shown you, they're doing what they're doing, and it's not our choice what they did. And quantum behavior appears wild to us, in a sense. But we believe it, not because of our senses, but because instruments much more reliable than our senses force us to do so. And here's an example of a spectrometer and the hydrogen atom orbitals of an electron. Uh, and it's this which can give us this picture. But no amount of us sitting on our backs will ever lead to that very accurate and reliable picture. Now, this leads to some uncomfortable consequences. It's a very popular belief uh, all over the world, and particularly in India, that somehow the ancients at some level guessed or intuited the truths of modern physics. And I'm not disputing that they guessed and intuited important truths, but I would dispute that those were truths of modern physics. And in fact, in my view at least, the laptop only, whoops, the laptop only exists because of this uh, experiment uh, of the electron gun, which ultimately proves that quantum mechanics is right. No quantum mechanics, no laptop. And until 100 years ago, we certainly didn't have quantum mechanics. And now let me briefly interface with something that I'm sure is of concern to everyone in this room. What is the social relevance of modern physics? Um, is it that I'm talking about something completely abstract, bare and dry, as compared with discussions of wildlife or of dance or of all these lovely discussions we've heard about computers, about other things today? Well, the answer to that, as usual, is that it's not really up to us. And I'd like to give you an example, a very famous one. Uh, Wilhelm von Röntgen was experimenting with some stuff in his lab. And he accidentally produced some radiation that today we call x-rays. And he discovered he had produced it by the fact that it fogged some photographic film lying around in his lab. And thereafter, he subjected his wife and various friends. Uh, this one is not his wife. This is a friend. Uh, whoops. The point I'm trying to make is that he accidentally discovered x-rays. And within a year, there was a sudden need for them. And this is sort of unprecedented in the history of science. The sudden need came from a war uh, in which it became imperative to find out where inside soldiers' bodies there were bullets. Okay, they would get shot in the war, and then they'd need to be operated. But how could you operate if you didn't know where the bullets were? And X-rays served that need beautifully. And uh, sorry to make you uncomfortable, but I'll briefly tell you how bullets were found in bodies before X-rays. They would insert a metallic probe into the wound and jiggle it around and try to see whether what they were feeling was bone or bullet. Okay, not very pleasant. So you see, here is an example of a non-working, dysfunctional computer. (laughs) 
but I don't believe any law of quantum mechanics is failing in spite of that. Okay, so after that I'd like to talk briefly about beauty and the only thing I want to highlight in this segment is that beauty can be not the spectacular pictures that you've been seeing all day, whether they be of wildlife or fractals or anything, it can have a different nature and then in that nature you have to sort of see the beauty in certain attributes like symmetry or unity or simplicity and these are the attributes I like to highlight. Uh, all right. So I have a nice quote about beauty and I'd like to read it out for you. Beauty is that which we ascribe beauty to that which is simple, which has no superfluous parts, which exactly answers its end, which stands related to all things, which is the mean of many extremes. This was said by Ralph Waldo Emerson and I'll try now to show you in what sense these uh, abstract uh, attributes of beauty are met in the subject that I work in, that is physics. Next slide please. Now here is a salt crystal or a bunch of salt crystals and you see that salt crystals look very irregular to the naked eye but in fact at the microscopic level, slow down, they exhibit a simple regular patterns, uh, in fact just an interleaved structure of sodium and chlorine atoms. Go on. Now their beauty is largely due to symmetry which is a key feature of physical laws and you see these beautiful arrangements of crystals, very visually appealing but also very stark and simple, come because the physical laws put things in certain very symmetric configurations. So here's one type of beauty in physics. Next please. But this kind of beauty that lies in unity, I find even more appealing to me, to my taste. For example, electricity and magnetism were once thought to be very distinct phenomena and today we understand them as being two different manifestations of a single science of electromagnetism with a single force, the electromagnetic force. And you see on the two sides of this equation, on one side we have magnets but on the other side we have lightning and nobody could have known that lightning and magnets would be the same thing but in fact they are and I find this a very, very special kind of beauty in physics. Next one please. Okay. Now another attribute of beauty that I like to emphasize here and it's very different from many things we've seen today is the sheer simplicity of the ultimate laws of nature and of the ultimate constituents of matter. Now we haven't necessarily got to the ultimate ones but here's a beautiful fact, everything in this room, everything you've ever seen, pretty much everything on earth is made up just of three different types of constituents, proton, neut protons, neutrons and electrons. It's a mind-boggling fact but it's a great simplification when you consider the diversity of phenomena and matter and interactions that are seen in nature and I consider this to be th the third and one of the most important attributes of beauty in physics. Okay. Now, up to now I was talking about relatively older physics, even if it was quantum mechanics, that's already a hundred years old. Next paragraph. All these examples belong at the latest to the early 20th century and for the rest of my four and a half minutes, I'll talk about contemporary physics and the new and beautiful truths that it's uncovered and I'd like to argue that the truth and the beauty of these new discoveries are now closer than ever intertwined. Now, a key aspect of all this is what is modestly called the standard model of particles and forces, which is a mathematical structure running into a few pages of equations, maybe two pages of equations, maybe one page of equations actually if you write very small. And this is a structure that allows us in principle to calculate every interaction that can possibly occur. Smash an electron against an electron, what will happen, how many, what fraction of the outgoing particles, how many events will they go at a particular angle theta from the beam axis, uh, how many will be deviated back, all that we can calculate to an extraordinary high degree of precision. It's a precision sometimes to one part in a hundred million, eight decimal places. It's quite unprecedented and it's there, we already have it. Next. So here's a nice picture that these accelerator people like to put together. Uh, this sort of encapsulates essentially all the elementary particles we have in nature, six kinds of quarks, six kinds of leptons which in turn are divided as neutrinos, neutrino type or electron type and four kinds of force carriers which explain the strong nuclear force 
the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force and gravity. Okay. So, this is a kind now it is not apparent from this picture that this is beautiful, it is also not apparent to you that it is true, it is only something that you can know when you calculate quantities using the page of equations that is this theory and then you go to Geneva and you perform an experiment and the experiment agrees with the calculation. That is when it is true and it is certainly beautiful, but this you will have to take my word for next. Okay. Now, a current ambition of scientists and this has occupied me for most of my scientific career is to understand how the different standard model particles and forces which we already understand could be unified into a single entity. Now, a nice little caricature of this is to imagine that I have a structure called a group. So, SO10 is a particular mathematical group. Okay. It has a particular mathematical structure that has been known for some centuries and the hope at least for the last 20 or 25 years and it's being vigorously pursued is that somehow in the representations of this mathematical group we will find electrons, quarks, bosons, WZ bosons, gluons, neutrinos, photons and muons all of them coming out as different manifestations of the basic SO10 field. And this is a proposal that is quite serious that is on the table and that is already been tested, but the test uh, one of the tests by the way was done in India in the uh, in the 80s, uh, the test for proton decay gave a negative result and so in fact, the simplest version of this theory does not work, which is also how science progresses, but we hope that a more fancy version of it might yet do so. Okay. Now, all this works without gravity, which is a force that is negligible at the scale of small elementary particles, but for conceptual reasons, we would like to incorporate gravity in this structure and when we do so, we get a different paradigm uh, and the paradigm is of a new theory called string theory and I would like to show you what is the basic hypothesis of string theory and then I will end. The basic idea here is that all particles and forces that we saw before arise as excitations of a single type of fundamental string and here in illustration is what a closed string might look like not vibrating or vibrating and on the side you will see the open string again not vibrating or vibrating and the hope is that these two types of strings in their vibration will produce all the particles we know and mathematics seems to favor that this idea is correct. Now, to understand this I have put together a little analogy for you just think of music musical notes sa, re, ga, ma and so on we think of them as distinct entities and in the literature they even have different natures, personalities, Sharja, Rishabh, Gandhar, Madhyam, they all have different natures, but in fact what we know is that they are manifestations of a single string vibrating in many different ways. And in quite an analogous manner, uh, if you consider elementary particles, you could ask the question, are electron, muon, quark, photon and so on really distinct entities as we see them or could it be that they are vibrations of a single fundamental string. And this idea is very beautiful, it has been pursued very vigorously, but it is not yet proven correct and experiments of the future can tell us if this or something else is the truth. So, I am done, I would like to end with a little quotation, uh, beauty is truth and truth is beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Thank you very much. <laughs>